Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural first reading of the new season of Carmen Street Metrics, the 2021 through 2022. We're very excited to have um, Mark McDonald and Nessa O'Mahony and Kyle Potvin joining us. Um, two of our readers are joining remotely from um, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, and it is very much an honor. And we are grateful that you are uh, tuning in and um, um, reading with us today in spite of the time difference. So as always, we are going to start with a few open mic readers. And the first open mic reader is our former co-host, Quincy Lea. Quincy, can you unmute yourself? And uh, Here we go. Yep. Okay, so good to see everyone. So this is a poem called Love in the Clinton-Yeltsin Era Central Time Zone. I saw her at the end of history, a manic pixie dream girl in black hat, a smile of adolescent irony hanging like an imported cigarette, a denizen of corners. As she sat off to the side, I stared. The smell of sweat, Doritos, and the Oklahoma air, sweet and allergic, hit my nose. I didn't sneeze and held a pensive pose. A Walmart of a decade, grunge CDs about to hit the bargain bin left stranded like hapless Soviet cosmonauts. The breeze reminded us that time, like space, still moved. The wall was down, the eagle long since landed, and we were told that nothing could be improved, that this was the teleology, the sum of humankind's equation. Cure our laughter at a light spent in the morning after. Never trust a hippie. Punk was dead, and there she was in her Doc Martin boots, with chin-length bangs and a partly shaven head, and me in clothes and hair of mostly black. The latter, though, showing some brown roots. With nothing up ahead, we both looked back and somehow found each other when we did. It's no way to travel, nor was the way mapped out for us. Another summer day, another night. The party was a bore, though everyone was there and every room echoed with conversations. You could score a few hours in your head if so inclined. An afternoon tale of special woe and doom, erasers in the center of your mind, or just a gacked out evening passing time with tabs of LSD or skunk swag weed, mushrooms, alcohol, or trucker speed. Brown hair and gray-green eyes, a high cheekboned face, insomniac intelligence. A joke she told herself running in a race between the glimmers of her glance and lips. I sneered, though fuck knows why, and lit a smoke. Arrogant from lungs to fingertips, the dumbest smart guy in the room, but still she followed me outside. Cue the blurred memories of teenage passage stirred. Ambition needs a narrative, an arc, rising action, climax, denouement. And what we had was groping in the dark, along with books we partly understood, discussed across a coffee and croissant some mornings. Good enough, if not quite good. Understanding is the bonus point. Experience itself, the pass and fail, the revolution, Jonah and the whale. I got the girl, or for a while at least, <laughs> mazel tov, yippee chaye. Behold the bread and theorize the yeast, but know that when you eat it, that's the end. Right into the sunset, what the hay. History wasn't over, that pretend conceit was soon demolished. We were too. I wouldn't say I miss her. The debris remains beneath, and archeology span reveals the substrates, relics of a life rebuilt on top of ruins. As I drive through a different city, kids and wife await me as the radio plays a song I barely liked but heard back then. Alive, but not like this, when summer seemed so long, when love was hard and love was what we had. I change the station, hum a melody that sings out past the end of history. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Quincy. Our next open mic reader is Gina Gruz. Gina, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Anton, thank you very much for inviting me. 
And I would like to read a poem called Delphine. Delphine. In pajamas, chewing a slice of bread with jam, I hear in the background Pearl Jam. Doll, like a Barbie doll. On a shelf in a cardboard, she smiles half bored. Her heart lukewarm. Her drink laced with an eight ball snowstorm. Her demeanor is deformed. This bleak lacy winter in Oz looks laced with ease. My fetish on the mattress. My fetish mistress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. Next up, Charlotte Ines. Can you unmute yourself? Is that good? Great. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read a poem that is actually an acrostic poem, and there's a reason for that, which I won't bother to explain, but it's uh, for an exhibit where poems are going to be, um, I guess I am explaining, poems are going to be put up next to the pictures, and this is in Ventura County, just north of Los Angeles, which is where I live. Okay. Um, it, <clears throat> And the artist was Charles Magalones, and it's, the picture was called Beyond the Mark. And my poem is called Inside My Father's Brain. A dreamy lilt of plaques and tangles, gentles me to half prefer his mildness now to the old mix of charm and anger, his look at me joy. Inside my father's brain, I still detect survivor strength. I'll do it my way. I find his childhood home, his travels drifting round in blinks, a canal, gray with waste, swimmers. Crossing the brain's multicolored map, dawn blue ideals still ache to save the poor as he was saved. A waxing crescent moon cries out from tangles. Wait, not done, not yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Okay. Our next open mic reader is David M. Gatz. <clears throat> Thank you, Anton. I'm going to read a very recent sonnet uh, that's going to appear in the Raintown Review, thanks to Quincy, uh, a man of taste. Um, it's called, Are You Still Drinking, Dad? Are you still drinking, Dad? He wouldn't say at first, or rather couldn't. I'd never asked. And he may have wondered if he'd got away without the need to answer for his lapse. I thought it was a decade since he'd quit. It might have been. He might have had one shot, a rise, a rye to ease the future shock a bit. Sweet gypsy rose, cheap peach or apricot liqueur. I said I'd be a father soon. And he was miles away across the phone on some highway with a cowboy tune fading far behind. He always drank alone. It's now or never, Dad, I might have said. Before my son was born, my dad was dead. Thank you. Thank you, David. And? On the same Zoom, Linda Stern. Uh, musical chairs. Uh, uh, the, uh, the title of this poem is Dining Alone, my book. And I realize uh, that our expectations about dining indoors and dining outdoors have kind of 
switch these days. Dining alone, there's an epigraph from Isaiah, return to me for I have redeemed you. In my own city, I never dine alone in outdoor cafes, preferring the discreet anonymity of dark recesses to hide my blunders, social, spiritual, from itinerant friends, acquaintances, the party I missed, the morning not at work, or today, the holy day, when I should be sitting in the pew, shriving my soul, seeking out the light behind the eyes, the deep charge of resting, return, or at least the dream of return. Though all I can think about as I order and eat in a rattled silence is you, how you left me, how dying ends one struggle that begins another, and how little real solace there is in knowing that suffering is not eternal, that heaven awaits. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so this time, I'm delighted to introduce our first feature reader. Mark McDonnell lives in Staffordshire, England with his wife, his teenage twins, and two cats. He taught English in secondary schools to 11 to 18 year olds for many years and now works as a supply teacher to anyone who will have him. He began writing poetry in his early 40s and uh, he has been published in various journals including the Drug Horse, uh, Thing Journal, Antiphon, Measure, and others, and recently appeared in the COVID themed anthology poems for 2020 from Shoestring Press, edited by Marin Williams. And it is our pleasure to welcome Mark. Uh, Mark, can you please unmute yourself? <clears throat> yes. Can you hear me? You can. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anton. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really enjoy doing the open the open mics here, and this is a real honour. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems. Um, see how many I can get into ten minutes. Um, so this first one is about a bunch of ne'er do wells, and it's called Smash and Grab. I remember pebbles on the drive, like bird's eggs, shiny, clean, and white. A porch with frosted glass and five wee cacti of descending height. Huddled, we crouched around the door, hushed in the dark on Primrose Way. Shorn in those dungarees he wore for rabbiting and mild affray. We wrap the spanner in the rag, then crack and reach around and in. I wiped my boots, John lit a fag. The room was warm like a biscuit tin. I don't remember what we took. Carriage clock, I think, then ran. I remember Billy's face though, struck with wonder, rare in any man. <laughs> Um, this one is a kind of a children's skipping rhyme. New girl. Holy Mary, buckle your shoe. Pray for us sinners in the hopscotch queue. The backs of your knees all lined and taut and the puffball skirt that your stepdad bought. A flame like a teardrop slides down your thigh as you hop, jump, hop, under thundery sky. Who is your favorite? Gobstopper Joe. Who knows your middle name? Nobody though. In a limbo panic, mine got robbed when a cord got tangled and a midwife sobbed. And it's my turn next on the pavement chalk, but your mother's calling from the top of the walk. Holy Mary, please don't go. At the hour of my death, I'll still want to know. Um, okay. so. 
the title of this poem is a sonnet, the next one. And the title comes from a, a Sandy Denny song, Fairport Convention song. <clears throat> Who knows where the time goes? My eldest daughter takes me to a gig, some psychedelic folk band, young and weird and gently retro hip. They won't be big. The music shambles, stares into its beard and coughs, a copy of Basket of Light on vinyl under its arm, a long and threadbare coat. I ask what happened to those songs she wrote when she was in her teens. She seems so final. I'm 27, she laughs. The dreaded year of rock star death, I'm done. I laugh along as minor chords are strummed. We know this song. All the birds are leaving. She sips a beer from a plastic cup then softly starts to sing. On stage, the mandolin player breaks a string. Um, okay, this is, this is a, I've read this one once before on open mic. It's the only one that I'm going to repeat. Uh, so this is, this is from the, in the, from a child's perspective. It's written in the voice of a child. And it's about something that somebody probably didn't deserve. Spuggy. He's up by the rope swing tree in Duck Egg Wood where Nolan carved the F word. I know him, yes, we call him Spuggy Joe. He'd hand out spug to all us kids. See, spuggy's like our word for chewing gum. And then he'd grab to kiss your mouth and hold your wrist and tug your hand towards him and you'd feel it like a rake in a baggy sack, chewing, chewing. But most of us said no and we'd tell our mums and they tell other mums and all would look like thunder, like there's more than tea that's brewing. I felt it coming, like someone banging drums. I told the priest about it in the booth. I hate not knowing whose it is, the face behind the slatted wood. You hear them breathing, see the shadow nodding. Father Firth, well, he's all right, but Father Cole is worse than Spuggy Joe, or so my mate said creeping around backstage with the altar boys, a monster with a monstrance, a dirty cassock lifter. But we didn't want him hurt. You best come now. He's lying there against the tree, a mess, sir. I think he tried it with O'Regan's sister. I think he tries to be nice, but doesn't know how. Thank you. Uh, this one is in, I've got three left, they're all fairly short. Um, this one's in Sapphic Meter, which, uh, for the knowledge of which I have to thank uh, my good friend Mary Marion. Well, she didn't invent it, that's somebody else, a long time ago. But uh, I would never have heard of it or been able to use it if it wasn't for her. So this is a, this is a, a, a Sapphic and it's called Carnival. Even in the schoolyard, I think I knew, yet gripped the heavy promise of pails of sunlight, shining plasma spilling down rusted metal, splashing on pavements. Turning slow in trampoline light and laughter, paper monsters dance on their clipper fasteners. All is breathless joy, and you said you'd meet me by the tombola. Ferris wheel, come turn for me, times are flying. Waltzers waltz me faster and blur the houses. Terraced rows dissolve into sulky dark like promises fading. Reach and hook for fishes in bulging plastic, flicking orange flash, but the sun is sinking. Colored lights now laid under thick tarpaulin loaded on lorries. Rolling out of town, they left flattened patches, empty cans and wandering in the twilight. Where you got to, Carnival Queen? I waited, laden with pennies.
Okay. Um, this is an this is an Easter poem in October. Um, it's called Green Hill. Stumbling up this English hill, the wind can make you fall three times. Their faces lashed, my children laugh and grab each other's coats. The town lies far below. And eggs are painted bright and boiled and pierce our palms with brittle cold. My daughter says, so is the egg the ceiling stone? Well, I don't know. We roll them, though. It's new life springing, I suppose. All is gone for them and me, but ritual. Still, the draw remains, the lure of the other hell, the skull. A face as pale as unleavened bread, but shadowed by the shouldered mass of two hewn hulks. His own trade mocked him, led him on and upwards to the final crux of things wobbling through a blur of blood. So many must have felt they've stood where he was said to stand, her jeering undeserved, sucked bitterness where brimming wine should be. Poor me, take the cup, they know not what. A church bell rings, and out of sight the eggs roll over the grassy brow. Our palms feel lighter. My son says, Dad, do we get chocolate now? <laughs> okay, all right, last one. I don't know how long I've done, but this, this is the last one. Perfect. Um, okay, this is another sonnet. And okay, it's set during, my dad died about three years ago and this is set during the, the wake in the pub after the funeral. Now it describes a trick, um, and, and I'm gonna show you the trick. So you put pennies on your elbow and, and you flick and you catch them. So you like that. So that's the trick. You do it with many more. Um, right, my brother and I do the tricks dad taught us. By now we're catching piles of 14 pennies off our elbows. Uncle Alec shimmies past in black with a pyramid of pints. He's pissed. He knocks me sideways into Auntie Janice and pennies clatter on her buffet lunch. Her ham and mushroom quiche, her sausage rolls, all crumbs and coins. Ah! Now Scottish reels replace Sinatra. People dance or lurch at least. My itching palms can sense the weight. My elbow steady, spirit level flat. Then bam, the coins like hummingbirds in flight. A sliding eye blink, time suspended. Wait. Later when he holds me, Alec mutters, it's how he would have liked it. That's what matters. Okay, I think that'll do. Thank you so Thank much for having me. Cheers. Thank you so very much. Mark. That was fantastic. At this time, I would like to invite everyone to unmute themselves or anyone who would like to, so that we can give a round of applause. Woohoo! Yeah, that's great. That was great. Thank you, Mark. Fabulous, Mark. Great work, Mark. Really great. Thank you so much. I loved it. Outstanding, outstanding, wow. A lot of local color over there. Our next open mic reader is uh, David Formanek. Can you please unmute yourself? There we go. Hi, everyone. How good to see all of you again. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I just can't make up my mind. So here we go. Cochleogenic, cochleognosis. The army of the proverb marches on its stomach. What does the snail know that eats with its foot? 
The whelk drools acid on a scallop, lapping through the borehole with a searching barbed tongue. Thoreau metaphored masked ants fighting the revolution. Periwinkles rasping algae from a tidal boulder act alone. A snail's life, that's its form. It's lived inside geometry for half a billion years. Easy number words, hard to coil a mind around. Consider how we live in squares, pacing cubicles and concrete blocks of flats. Designers ponder over curves or corners, ordered form or ad hoc extension. The low bait sprawl of mold and glacier or willful rigor of linear measure. The snail grows outward, always churning, infilling a widening spiral of lime, a machine to live in, a graph of existence. Adhering to its earthy present, it sticks to rocks, it clings to sticks, it scrolls its gastrobiography, a varnished trail that winds back to the garden Stalked eyes discern vague shades of blur while gliding over turf or underwater, growing cell by cell, a tough or fragile shell, eating on the slide. It never knows the hell of human aches that only humans make. Can the snail know its own perfection? Thank you. Nice. Thank you, David. Our next reader is John Foy. John, can you unmute yourself? Anton, is that good? You can hear me now? Uh, we can hear you, but I cannot see you. I don't know if anybody else can. Right. Your I screen don't, is... I don't... I can't but. quite figure out what's happening there, but you know what? It might be better that you not see me. Um, so I will just uh, okay. speak, right? You don't need okay. my face. You just need my voice, I hope. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read a poem. Um, it's called Mania, and it's about various types of mania and it employs words that, um, that designate compulsions and um, unnatural enthusiasms. Um, so there it is, mania. I would meet you upon this honestly. I am sick, but not with cacospectomania, the neurotic staring at repulsive things, and not with coprolalamania, that hunger for the scatological. And dipsomania, I don't have that, the morbid need for steady alcohol. But let me circle back to you on that. I don't go around with empleomania, the insatiable urge to hold public office. And lagniomania, well, I declare I am not preoccupied with lechery. My problem here is metromania, the catastrophic need to write in verse. At least it's not ophidiomania, an excessive interest in reptiles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Our next open mic reader uh, reading for the first time uh, with us is Angela Franz. Lovely to be here and it's lovely to see some faces I've only known through Facebook so far. So I'm really looking forward to coming back in March as well. Um, I'm going to read a poem from my newest collection, Terminarchy, um, which came out in July. W.H. Auden famously said, Poetry makes nothing happen. Poetry makes nothing happen. Let it make nothing happen more this year so that a young girl whose mail arrives early can read the book she's waited for over breakfast and find the poem 
with blue depths and points of light. She tastes in the back of her throat on the way to work and walked a little slower than usual so that nothing happens as she crosses the road because the guy in the four-wheel drive who was answering a call on his mobile already passed by. Also that a fighter sits up almost all night reading Rumi, trying to understand death and blood, peace and love, and sleeps too late to be ready for the knock at the door, so tells them he'll follow after because he wants to hold his son and play with his daughter and nothing happens as he kisses his children because he isn't in the car when the government missile hits it. Also that a man, sleepless and pacing, picks up a book from his wife's bedside and reads a poem casually, but finds lines stick in his mind like birds on a wool sock, like when he used to spend weekends relaxed and outdoors, so that he holds back on giving an order and extends credit on a couple of loans, so that nothing happens to a lot of people that day who carry on going to work and never even know that nothing happened. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. Our next open mic reader will be Carolyn Raphael. Unmute myself. Oh, Carolyn, I think you actually muted yourself. Can you? Yes, now it's better? Yes. yes. Good, thank you. Uh, this is a poem about uh, assuming other identities when your own is just not doing the job. And uh, these are classical identities. It's called Metamorphosis. Whenever I see Daphne's toes begin to root in marble soil, her fingers leafing from Apollo's grasp, which makes her flesh recoil, I realize that change is good, not only to ward off advances, and like a sudden legacy should invigorate one's circumstances. The rules say there is no reversing a classical identity, no trying on and no rehearsing, so I must find one meant for me. Not echo with her borrowed voice. I interrupt, it would be fair. Or Arethusa spring, bad choice. Damp weather gives me frizzy hair. Nor Eo who could not escape when Juno's gadfly wrecked her life. Not even Galatea's shape would lure me to the sculptor's knife. On second thought, I think I'll wait, applying at the final stroke for Baucis and Philemon's fate, a linden mingled with his oak. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, right, at this time, I would like to introduce our second future reader. Nessa O'Mahony was born in Dublin, Ireland, and lives there now. She won the National Women's Poetry Competition and was shortlisted for the P Patrick Kavanaugh Prize and Hennessy Literature Awards. She is the recipient of three literature bursaries from the Arts Council of Ireland. She has a PhD in creative writing from Bangor University and teaches with the Open University and the American College in Dublin. She has published five books of poetry, including Bartok, Trapping a Ghost, Inside of Home, and Her Father's Daughter, and uh, The Hollow Woman on the Island was published by Salmon Poetry in May 2019. Her first work of historic crime fiction, The Branch Man, was published by Arlen House in 2018. She's co-edited several anthologies of poetry, including Divining Dante with Paul London, a celebration of the 700th anniversary of the Italian poet Dante Alighieri, and also with Alan Hayes' Days of Clear Light, a fest shift for Jesse Landini of Simon Poetry 2021. So it is a pleasure and an honor to welcome Nessa O'Mahony. Nessa, can you uh, unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much. And it is such a, a pleasure to be here to join you tonight. Um, it's tonight in, in Dublin. It's, it's uh, dark and slightly moody. And um, that's probably why there seems to be so much fear in the poems that I'm going to read for you tonight. Uh, I think it's also something about middle age as well 
Uh, but thanks so much to, to Therese and Anton and Wendy for having me along tonight. Um, the first poem I'm going to do for you, I probably need to explain that uh, Roger Casement, who was mentioned, was a, an Irish revolutionary who was executed by the British Army uh, in uh, 1916 because he was caught trying to import arms. And in 1966, he was exhumed and reinterred in Dublin as part of the, the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising. And the other thing I should mention is St. Michan's Church in Dublin is, um, it has a uh, medieval mummy, uh, a knight, a crusading knight, and back in the day before uh, health and safety regulations, you were invited to shake the mummy's hand for good luck. So those two things are, are referenced in this poem. Bogeyman. 1st of March, 1965. When I was one, they resurrected him, dug up the scraps of bone from Bentonville quicklime, packed them in oak, Draped flags, slow marched the gun carriage through sleety 60s streets. Snow flickered images on our TV screens, huddled crowds signing as the carriage passed to the beat of Charles Mitchell's sonorous tones, Requiem in Pachem. Did it come from this, that first terror? Did I confuse casement with the Mitchens' mummy? Think his Glasnevin tomb must be visited, a crusty hand shaken? Was it he who made shadows darken on the landing, exert a gravitational pull through the doors of the upstairs landing to the wardrobe where the bogeyman hid, till displaced by whatever fear du jour gripped me bonely? In the 70s, it was tubular bells that lowered temperatures, heightened sheets. Each decade found its own vortex of imps straddling chests, white mares snorting. It ends with the banality of a waiting room, a dead celebrity waving from the cover of an old hello, a raised bump beneath skin, a white draped man scanning penumbras on illum illuminated screens. So yes, a fearful time. Um, the next poem is called A Vertebra in Slow Time and it's for the poet Geraldine Mitchell. It could be a Henry Moore propped by the door in sun-bleached calcium. Mossed saddle, emerald bright, topmost point of its tricorn casts shadow on the plastered wall. The ovoid gape where the spinal cord once ran is a perfect eye of whatever storm beached it. No living memory recalls who found it, dragged it up from the shore and placed it in lieu of a boot, boot scrape, perhaps a hiding place, the keys. Still useful after all these centuries, calcified into art. This is when you realize that you have set your teleprompter to go far too slow and then it goes far too fast so we're kind of stuffed here um this next poem is for a uh, very fine irish poet called philip casey who died in 2018 and when he died we were actually in london visiting um and involved in a a, a poetry launch um and we got the news of his death and suddenly it all seemed to be about echoes of that so it's called do not ask. We didn't plan for it, but these past days we've stalked death as we've wandered streets, looked up at domes, tried to remember the past without Googling it. Skulls everywhere, on market stalls, behind glass in the Ritz of Burlington Arcade, bells tolling the footfall. Then, the pink room where Keats spotted red, signed his death warrant in a four poster bed. And here now returned to our borrowed bed in the shades of St. Paul's. We take our beat from the chimes till the phone beeps 
with the news. You'd have seen the joke. We're always the first to try out new technology, to match it to old words. Another bell, and I know for whom it told, old friend. Still very much missed. Um, Philip Casey did a huge amount for a lot of, of, of Irish writers. And I mentioned Keats. Um, this year was his 200th anniversary. Um, so this poem is called The Lost Nightingale. Not a word of a lie. In Carton, May 1955, the dawn chorus swelled by a new voice that warbled through the dark hours of a Kildare plain. As the sun rose, it thrilled 1,000 grace notes, startling thrushes out of tune, bemusing blackbirds. Would a pip, would a pip, went the unanswered call to fellow travellers who'd left Sub-Sahara, followed the trade winds back towards haunts in Mayfair and Oxted, to once again sing for em emperors and clowns. The solitary blow-in, drowsy and numbed by an Irish summer of late sleet, bare beaches, finally rose, buffeted on prayer and wing towards the Wicklow coast, casting little shade as it passed above fields of alien corn. This next poem um, I actually wrote in memory of a man called Josie Gray, who was the partner of my good friend, the American poet Tess Gallagher. He told this story um, called The Hair on the Chest. So I wrote it for him after he died. The Hair on the Chest. A regular from your repertoire. A man walks into a field, watches a pack, their baying, the zigzag chase of a breathless hair, its desperate leap of faith into the dark gap between the man's coat and chest. How he feels its heartbeat holds his ground as the hounds surge. The crowd now follows your coffin, edges the incline towards Ballandoon Abbey, pauses to look west as low clouds roll over the water and the lake's own breath is exhaled. There are murmurs, families well met, old friends remembered, enmities forgot. You're laid to rest, snug on the hare's chest. And this next poem um, is uh, from my most recent collection, The Hollow Woman on the Island, and, and it's the, the title poem. The Hollow Woman on the Island. The hollow woman sits in her car, watching the sea lick its lips at the edge of the pier, till the sides of the car disappear and the windscreen dissolves into waves and grey crests, drawing her into depths she has dreamed of nightly. She does not float, despite the vacuum inside her. She rolls, edges rounded off by the water's oscillation, till she's smooth, buffed into ovoid shape, tie tossed onto damp sand, sand to be plucked up, pocketed, placed with care on a mantelpiece, a grave top. And then um, continuing this theme of, of losing one's nerve, I suppose, um, this is a, a recent poem called Things for Which There Is No Longer Purpose. It takes time to get your eye in when beach combing. Stones merge, little distinguishes itself from shingle, pell-mell debris of tides on the channel between this side and the next. You need to keep your glance down, let the slow rhythm of step after step, pebble after rock after pebble, give distinction, let shapes emerge and form into sea glass, shells, gaping crabs, innards violet. The urge grows to find patterns beyond the Fibonacci cockles. Why this search for meaning? What can this nibbled lid of a ceramic coffee pot tell me of accident, of transience? Are this a knuckle of sandstone, sea tossed, handcrafted, who knows? Are most mysterious, the metal encased rust impued pipe, ship screw, gas line, 50 years, two centuries, 
tossed by waves, then dumped without ceremony? Who says its purpose was to be found, to be understood? Earlier, we turned hairpin bends in search of beauty. There was a time when I could navigate, feel the grip of wheel, trust my steering, my courage. Now I leave that to you, knowing that more than coins flip, that every breath has two outcomes. And I'm going to finish with this poem, um, which was written in Easter 2020. So it references this strange uh, crisis that has afflicted us all. It's called Boss in Erin, which is uh, the Irish for death in, in Ireland. And it would have been a toast. Um, people, Irish emigrants in particular, would, would uh, greet each other. Um, Boss in Erin. Boss in Erin, Easter 2020. From her social distance, my mother points to a six inch cardboard tube she found in a bookcase in those long hours of quarantine. I can't open it, she says, yet her face tells me she has, has already read the messages on this Dead Sea Scroll from the people we were once. We could still congregate then, made jokes, dashed down our thoughts on the parchment the government gave us with the millennium candle. My brother wrote, boss in Aaron, not knowing he'd take him at his word a decade later. My father relied on his old favorite, Gemeramid Bio, which means may we be alive this time next year. Hmm. When he died alone, we were still sleeping. No screen divided us. No latex glove held his hand on our behalf. Hmm. Is anyone death better than another? These days, we are careful what we wish for. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much, Nessa. Um, that was amazing. Um, again, I would like to invite everyone to unmute themselves so that we can applaud for Nessa's reading. Thank you. Right. So this time we're going to take a five minute break. So our next open mic reader will be Anne Drysdale. Anne, please unmute yourself. So Anne, you are muted. There. there are we all right now? We can hear you. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm taking a bit of a risk here because I'm going to read an ekphrastic poem um, without being able to show you the picture that it's based on, which is a medieval altarpiece depicting the baptism of Christ by uh, Niccolo de Pietro Gerini. And I saw it in the National Gallery and there was one thing that particularly caught my attention. The poem's called How Beautiful Are the Feet. Jesus is tall. John has to really stretch so as to tip his terracotta pot over the high head of the Son of Man. God's chuffed. He's just let go the Holy Spirit to send it plummeting headfirst from heaven. The kamikaze nosedive showcases its silly feet. Two brown banana skins that stick out sideways from the fuselage, making me laugh out loud. Oh, Niccolo, what a fine thing to offer to the Lord. God's good at feet, a wizard finishing the legs of birds. I've always loved the gnarly grabs of irritated chickens, the whisker digits of the wren, the soft, underdeveloped token feet of swifts. I grinned a bit at the lobed toes of coots until I watched one running on soft mud with her umbrellas spreading underfoot to take her safe across the top of it, turning to oars as she launched on the water. 
On the beaches of the Galapagos, the booby shuffles in his blue suede shoes as though nobody but his love is watching. Despite the shadows of the looming cruisers, and the sassurus of the clicking twitches. To each God gave according to its need, regardless of the flocks of jeering hooters. Lord, may the six feet that I end beneath lie light as those that have amused me most, the coot, the booby, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm glad that the audio worked out for you after all this was worth waiting for. Uh, thank you. And our next reader on the open mic is Meredith Bergman. Hi there, thank you. Um, for a somewhat haunted month of October, I'm going to read The Witch of Grove Street. A block from school, her weeping mulberry dropped berries, reddening the clean concrete. The tree was practically in the street. In memory, its berries taste of glee and daring mischief, sweet as party punch. Erupting from her door to scatter us, she seemed much larger than her small frame house, and we ran gasping home to get our lunch. But not before we called her names. Old witch was probably the worst. I know she heard and hated. We loved the weapon of the word. We loved to cut each other with a switch of epithet, a curse. She has no face in memory. The mulberry, its bare contorted winter branches gnarled to scare and its embedded scowl will take that place. I see gray hair as mine has turned, and how a twist of woodwork fit like cobweb in the gable of her door. She's fast and thin. Why must I see her in my mirror now? As if her tree, its gothic attributes, are now engraved in my expression, stripped of its sweetness, forcing me to question how I will best protect my fragile fruits. Thank you so much, Meredith. Next up in my creator is R. Nemo Hill. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Late apples. Some die young, some barely blush and dip and drop to rot in the rush of wind through wet grass. Brief stains on green ground. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Most hold on according to plan, but here's no harvest. There are too few hands. No one speaks, no one understands, and summers wrung out every sound. Ashes, ashes. We all fall down. We're taught that seasons come, then go, each striding neatly in its row. The calendar would have it so. Yet these hang on to swell and heave to branches stripped of burning leaves, raw rubies dangling till they freeze to brown beneath the early snow. Defiant. Still, they will not go. They're hollowed into pendant ghosts as gangs of grackles peck their skin in search of what ferments within. Frost and thaw keep leathering the stubborn rhymes. Black bells unrung. Dirty paper lanterns slung to shadow by the setting sun. They fade into what can't be found dark jewels of my eyes uncrowned. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Thank you, Nemo. And the next open mic reader 
before I introduce our third feature is John Wall Barger. Thanks so much, Anton, for having me. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, hi everybody, I'm enjoying the reading enormously. Um, I'm in Philadelphia uh, next to Clark Park and outside I can hear these, this deep drumming kind of drifting in through the window. It's very nice. Uh, I wanna read a poem called Self-Harm Song. So here it is. Once the day I met a woman, she showed me her upper thigh. Deep red rivers ran across it. She lives, she explained, in the black stream beneath perfection. What, she said, cut, if not yourself. Such a release, it just feels right. Some of us barber ourselves as show mice do, nipping and licking our fur till it peels off like a hay roof in a hurricane. Some caged birds pluck their feathers, mutilate their skin. You sense, as the knife sinks in, the ancient laughter howl out of outrage, pulse speed of the world. It hurts, but is honest. Sid Vicious knew it. Eunuch priest, too, self-flagellating on the day of blood, dies sanguinous, eyes rolling in fever dream parodies of Christ. O oh, self-harm goddess, part phoenix, chained and flaming, touch a cataclysm, heart a crucifixion. Chimera of humi humiliation, release us. She responds, daughters, sons, other ones. To crack the egg of the hidden, hidden island, turn your shame inward. So that's what we tell our fledglings with every wink and poke. We don't know how to soothe them, we can hardly soothe ourselves. So we, waving, laughing, thumbs up, trot you out of doors in your bright dresses and iron shirts into the sunlight alone. I had a bandy-legged dog. She got so distraught when I went out, she licked her paw to the bone. She meant no harm. It was just love she didn't know where to put. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, John. And, uh... This time, I'm going to introduce our third feature reader. Carl Potvin's debut full-length poetry collection is Lucen from Hobblebosch Books 2021. Her chapbook, Sound Travels on Water, won the Jean Pedrick Chapbook Award. She's a two-time finalist for the Howard Nemerov Sonnet Award Capons have appeared in Bellevue Literary Review, Star River Poetry, Rattle, Ecotone, The New York Times, and others. She is a peer reviewer for Whale Road Review. Kyle lives in Southern New Hampshire. So welcome, Kyle. Hi, everybody. It's so great to see you. I wish we were all in at autos right now, but uh, drinking our Mai Tais, but this is really great to see everyone. And what a wonderful evening or afternoon of poetry. I mean, uh, Mark and Nessa, your, your work is beautiful. And um, the open mic readers, I mean, just all of it really stunning. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Anton and Wendy and Therese for having me. Um, I thought I'd start by reading a poem that just came out in Think. Uh, it's a poem that I read right after Cambridge, uh, wrote right after Cambridge for, uh, died and also a friend uh, from high school. And I thought it might be appropriate to read this as others may be missing Kim as well. Memorial of Bone. A friend died last night, one today, a sign of what is to come. I don't mean death more a solitary ghosting as I pour each night alone my cold, light-bodied wine. I walk into the lake, each step a stone, sharp as a wolf's fang. Friends, where are you now? Suspended in this ashen air somehow, beneath my toes, memorial a bone. A small animal, lungs full, water frail, drowns herself in a tempting skim of seed. 
her nails click against the smooth wall of need, unable to escape the brimming pail. I'm gonna read a longer poem from my new collection that Anton just talked about. It's called Lucin, um, is the name of the collection. And this poem will give you an idea of some of the themes that are in there um, around illness and loss um, in New York. And uh, I like to think hope. And this is called Going Under. It's in four sections in blank verse. Going Under. Each week they hooked me up and dripped a drug into my vein that took me to a world where everything was gone. No light, no sound, nor even recollection of a breath. I didn't mind the drifting off, the loss of faces loved and those I barely knew, or words, the way they failed me, like a plunge in icy water stops the heart mid-beat. I sat beside a woman several times, our chairs reclined, IV pole standing guard. We talked of books. She handed me the one she read, its famous author, her good friend. As I accepted this last gift, my tongue softened into clay, a potter molding it. I think, I hope, I said, I'm going un- she looked as if she envied my escape. Two, I walk into a dive and sit alone, another formless body at the bar. The others stare until I start to drink. They soon forget I'm not a regular. I sink into the stool, no history. I could be anyone from anywhere, hint, do you know my mother's maiden name? I scratch a K into the wood and leave. Outside, I disappear again. The streets are full of people wearing black. I blend in with my monochrome, long jacket, jeans, and leather boots. An average looking girl. No threat to anyone. Just don't look up. They'd read a novel in my eyes blue eyes. My parents both have brown. A difference, it seems, that only I have cared about. Three. My doctor recommends a restaurant. Hungry, my family searches for the site. My tongue can taste Branzino from the grill. Tomatoes, olives, spritz all offer all. The decades passed. Since 10 years since I was sick and 30 since I first explored this place. Those years I felt the need to leave my home and disappear into another life. These streets could hide you for millennia. The aqua alta washes clues away. My sons are almost at that age. They're here, but soon they're on their own. Will they return? We lose our bearings in the alleyways. Ahead, a wooden bridge may take us there. Wait, I say, and cross the bridge myself. I see the way. I wave for them to come. Four. The beach chairs, empty, line the spit of sand. They watch like critics poised to write reviews. My number soon will come. I follow loons, their ballet anguished with their mournful call. One time I knew each step of their routine, but now I'm bored and scatter them away. I wade in noisily. Small rocks don't hurt my feet. I dive, emerge, and start my dance. A practice breaststroke comes to me from pools and lakes, tyclongs and seas. I am surprised it is a welcome thing, the way the muscles memorize the past and share it differently. I float onto my back, a kick, a wave of fingers steadies me. The glare's not harsh. A rush of water drowns my face. 
I gasp. Now's not the time to fall beneath the waves. I was gonna read a, a sonnet from Lee Sin, um, but I don't often get requests. So I thought I'd go with Ned and Jane's request. And I'm gonna read um, Time Step because my friends at Pow Wow are probably completely sick of hearing me read Sin. <laughs> Time Step. A leaf or frog brushes against my lane hops across my lane, dances across where it is dark and I can hardly see. And not because I'm riding while driving, that would be wrong, but because I am vain or lazy or forgetful about wearing my new glasses. Do you recall this age? And in the dark, I can't see more than some movement that looks like a leaf hopping or leapfrogging or perhaps two tap dancing across the street. When I was young, you taught me to dance, tap dance, the time step, the triple time step. Time splits into pieces, shuffles them until my face is forgotten. Shuffle hops, the two of us, you in your chair, shuffling slippered feet. Me driving in this car, brushing my eyes, time blowing like this frog hopping like this leaf. And I'm gonna finish with one last um, poem. That's a newer one. It's, uh, it was in um, COVID Spring, which is a anthology for COVID um, poems. And um, don't tell, but I actually wrote it before COVID <laughs> and it was called At the End of the World. And then COVID happened and it just seemed to fit. This is called Late in the Pandemic. It's a duplex, which is a form created by Jericho Brown. And um, if you don't know the form, you should read his description of kind of how it all came together. Late in the Pandemic. We cook on the beach now, weeks with no power. I bring flour and salt to ration flavors. I bring flour and salt to ration flavor. Currency in the form of biscuits. My neighbors slay deer. My currency, biscuits. Once I thought of learning to build a fire. Why didn't I learn to build a fire or grow potatoes or milk a cow? I crave grilled potatoes milk in my coffee. Now I must eat whatever remains. I saved one pan to prepare what remains. Someone has kindly kindled the flames. Someone shares water for dough, pan on the flames. We cook on the beach. We have no power. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Kyle. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, please, everyone, unmute yourselves if you would like, so we can all applaud. So thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Nessa. And thank you, Mark, for amazing features. And many, many thanks to all our open mic readers. Now, this officially concludes our reading, but we do have a few uh, people on the standby uh, list for the open mic. And, um, you know, if you would like, if you need to go, uh, you know, you, of course, are welcome to do so. But if uh, anybody that would like to stay for a few more minutes, I'd like to uh, invite you to do so. And we can have a, f uh, a few more open micers to conclude the evening. So um, the first uh, open mic on this list is Zara Rob. Zara, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I'm going to read a very short poem. Um, hold on.
called The Poet's Graveyard. Um, the reason I'm, I chose this poem to read was because I just heard that uh, the, Sa the San Francisco poet uh, Jack Hirschman, some of you may know, has died. Uh, and uh, this poem is called The Poet's Graveyard. I, I was thinking of him. He was, he was a wonderful poet in his way. Uh, miss him. Poet's Graveyard. The poet Ferlin Geddes dead, a century old this year of plague, when breath could kill. Ivan Bolind, poet and muse of Ireland, well known and loved, she too has died. When famous poets lie beneath the grass, their toast to love and health shaped in five foot lines, find praise, each stone a seraph flag to raise in, in memory of an August death. But most do not exist in print. No New Yorker once and no Agni has known the rapture of these mourned. The snappy street bards who once sojourned to the open mic by night who knew no better end and signed in song their tabs of wine. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed this hearing your poems today. Thank you very much, Zara. So uh, the next open mic reader is Anne Schumann. Anne, would you like to read? A little bit of a surprise, so I didn't have any particular thing prepared. Um, so here is a short one that is in rhyme. It's called Dragonfly Lullaby. When the night is blackest blue or is absent of all hue, then I dare embrace the void to keep me from being void above the deep. When my heart's a twisting cave, bring no torches in to save me from my necessary battles with the monsters roars and rattles where they creep. When my eyes are eclipsed orbs, but can still see grave and corpse, let me join her where she lies. Bring a choir of dragonflies singing needling lullabies so I can sleep. Thank you very much, Anne. And I hope that uh, you'll come back um, for more um, readings in the future. Looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So our next open mic reader is uh, Harvey Sauce. Harvey, would you like to- Can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, let me bring the poem up. Uh, this one is called, if I can find the beginning of it, Letter from Carthage. He wrote of subjects he wouldn't talk to us about, bodies piling up like peanut shells on a barroom floor, crushed underfoot by advancing armor, assuring our mother before she was our mother that his sifting of desert war sand had revealed no Keatsian worlds to speak of more peaceful than ours is, filling his monogrammed leather journal in a hand inspirited by the nearness of Carthage. Entries to lure her thoughts away from present danger, the second battle of El Alamein towards the second Punic War. When the Carthaginians lost everything except their courage and our interest. Hannibal's elephants, especially in defeat, casting big shade on the triumphant wolves of Scipio Africanus, as if to say, yo, Scipio, dude, let Rome bay while Carthage in ruins accounted a loser indoors, preeminent in the hearts and minds of not so Rome-centric historians and the romantics among us, poets of a certain bent in theses of Punic War specialists, like that hapless football team you wouldn't bet on but just can't help rooting for. That my father not 
yet my father was a fanboy of Carthage, as he was of my mother, dug a foxhole we shared and still share our deep love of family and history. The pharmacist in peacetime, in letters unseen and unsent, he served up fresh prescriptions for adoration, telling of his absence without leave from the Army's medical corps, if only for a few hours, risking brig or firing squad if charged with desertion for history, for her, before he had earned his bronze star making his journal discovered in a drawer after her death that much more compelling. Day tripping out of his head, carolines of a war theatrically silent for a time as were walkies of general staffers scouting desert terrain from camo jeeps, Axis and allies respectively plotting next moves, Ramo and Montgomery, chess championship of the dunes down to those two, searching for any signs of weakness in their rival's game. My father saw his chance and took it going AWOL to survey the ruins. One man squatting on a bit of wall, his cursive retelling of city-states facing off across the Mediterranean, interrupted by a call to arms. Around the hip curve of North Africa battle weary men fought and fought again as in the Punic Wars, the Axis's hope for world dominion foundering on Maghreb's shores. In the brief interludium between tank engagements, conflict having boosted the value of prosthetics manufactured on the stock exchange with arms and legs flying off more often than allied sorties, my father described taste testing a pinch of sand for some hint of its signature saltiness, the rot beneath the skin of bodies left too long in the sun, the spot he was in, having seen too much death. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey. Um, yeah, two more readers. Uh, next up, uh, Peter Kroc. Peter, would you like to read something? Sure, thank you. Um, from my book, Wounded World. Aren't I unmuted? Yes, you are. We can hear you. This is um, called Plinkies. Down with its own private room in the home of my mind. On the meatless day Friday, mom made plinkies. I peeled out the eyes and brown spots, then grated the potatoes on the yellow kitchen table. I scraped until there was the smallest piece, about the size of a half used bar of hotel soap. Often I scraped my knuckles against the grater and traces of blood would come into the soupy batch Yes, my blood would seep into the bowl, and I think a part of me is here. Mom would mix two eggs and flour in the batter to give the mixture body. Put less than oil in the pan, heat the pan until it sizzled, then pour the potato mix into the pan. When she thought the underside was rusty brown, she turned the potato pancakes over and put them on a plate. I'd sprinkled sugar when I was younger and salt when I got older. Yes, my blood is back there in the kitchen of that red brick row house. It keeps weeping into my words until no one will remember. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And finally, our well, last reader Thank you. is James B. Nicola. Yes, hello, hello, everybody. Can you hear me, Anton? We can hear you, yes. Wonderful. I'm so happy to be finally hearing Kyle do her poetry. She's been so supportive of me over the years in coming to events. And I just wish I had the ability to do one of my poems from England or one of my poems from Ireland. 
to honor Nessa and Mark, but I'm going to do my latest poem, and so here it is. Roadside Distraction Whether your shrine is for a him or her, a sight can only do what a sight does. The loved one is no longer what they were, nor can they ever be. So we confer a cross, bouquets, some photos, mementos to liven up the last of him or her with still life where the human cannot stir. And now the breathless bussing of a breeze reminds us they're no longer what they were nor where. Yet, while they're nowhere, they are here. This is one of the universal laws of love and loss of any him or her I've known too well. My loved one's shrine kept for too long, perhaps. I don't let go because the shrine's the last place who and what they were was. One more law of loss, of which I'm sure that love lives on, just not the way it was. But through these living shrines to him, to her, they make us still no longer who we were. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you very, very much. And um, thanks to all of our open mic readers. Thanks again, Kyle, Mark, Nessa. Fantastic to hear all of you. So great to hear uh, to have um, all of you here. Um, I think it was a wonderful start to the new season. So I hope that you will join us next time, November 7th. We're going to have Angela Lemo O'Donnell. Dennis Soderling and David Yezi as our future readers. So hope to see you again then. Have a good evening, everyone.